Hey everybody, um, I'm Sean Raspid. I'm a flavorist, I'm an artist. Um, in the past I've worked at uh, Soylent for about a year and a half as their in-house flavorist. Uh, developed a lot of flavors that should be coming out in the next few quarters, I think. And uh, recently I founded my own company called Aquaforma, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but first, I want to kind of pivot and talk about something that we probably haven't been giving much focus to today, uh, and that is chemicals. So. Who here uh, prefers that their food has a lot of chemicals in it? <laughs> Anyone? Okay, we got one person. Cool. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and forgive me for reading off my notes a little bit. Uh, there's a lot, a lot to say. But um, so the word chemicals is pretty scary these days. Um, and what is a chemical? Well, we know theoretically we are all made of chemicals, right? Uh, we're chemical beings. We're carbon-based life forms. We've all learned that in school. Um, so um, we know basically everything we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis is made of atoms, uh, with the exception of energy, like light or heat. Um, and uh, chemicals are basically just specific arrangements of atoms that bond together to form a particular molecular structure. Uh, so we know that theoretically, everything around us is also made of chemicals. And this includes all the food we eat, the water we drink, and the air we breathe. Um, and so if we were to eat food that didn't contain any chemicals, we'd just be eating nothingness. Maybe we'd be photosynthesizing, but then we'd still be chemical. Um, so um, if everything is chemical, what are the implications of this? What does this mean in the real world? Uh, well, for one thing, it's the basis of the flavor industry, uh, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but another thing that it means is that when we look at things on a molecular level, there's no difference between natural and synthetic or natural and artificial. And why is that? So, it's a lot like if, if a chemical substance is made of a certain type of molecule and those molecules are just specific defined arrangements of atoms, then any collection of atoms that are bonded together in that specific arrangement will be that molecule. Uh, so it's a lot like language. Um, if you think about it, if you put together the letters F O O D, it spells food. Um, doesn't really matter, it, you know, if those are written in the sand on the beach, or if those are on a computer screen, or if you took, you know, some magazines and cut out the letters F O O D and then you glued them together. You know, it spells food. It's just a matter of how those individual components are arranged. That's the kind of universal law of physics and chemistry. So we know hydrogen cyanide, uh, obviously really bad, right? Dangerous, terrible molecule. Um, but theoretically, following this principle, we could take the hydrogen atoms off of si hydrogen cyanide. We could purify that into a gas, pure hydrogen gas, right? Then if we combust that in the atmosphere under oxygen, it would form water. Now, could we drink this water? Yeah, absolutely. It's H2O, it's just like any other form of water. Um, so this is kind of, uh, you might have seen this actually, but this is the ingredients of a all natural banana. And this is from James Kennedy. He's a, uh, chem uh, he's a chemistry teacher, a professor in Australia. Uh, so you can kind of read through all those different, you know, chemical ingredients. There's lots and lots of long, scary sounding words. And this isn't an all natural banana. This is a, let's say an organic banana with no pesticides and no uh, flavors added or anything. So this is just a straight up banana. Um, and towards the end, that's where you get into the flavors. Those are very, very small proportions in the overall banana. Here's uh, blueberries. Benzaldehyde is a really nice molecule, by the way. It's uh, kind of, if you want to make something that's like a marzipan out of just like a paste with sugar, just add some benzaldehyde. It's instant marzipan. Um, it's also kind of maraschino cherry. It's, it's great. Um, so, there's an egg. So you can read through all these. Now look, especially at the bottom, there's uh, benzene. benzene derivatives, uh, and then a little bit further up, there's formaldehyde, right? Now those are all carcinogens, but they're present in eggs, but they're present at such a small level that your body can process them, it can filter them out. It's not 
dangerous, it's not at that level going to give you cancer. Most people are more worried about the cholesterol in eggs. Who, who here's an anti-vaxxer? Just curious. No judgment. Okay, okay, cool. Um, so <laughs> there is, okay. Thank you for, for being honest. Um, so this is from an anti-anti-vaxxer website. Um, and it's comparing you know, formaldehyde that's found in a vaccine versus the formaldehyde that your own body makes. And your body does make formaldehyde. It's a natural byproduct of our own metabolism. And this is, just for comparison, this is the formaldehyde in a pear versus what you would find in a vaccine. And you know, just formaldehyde is one of the things that uh, I think are, uh, is a concern for the anti-vaxxer movement. There's others, but you know, just to deal with that one uh, chemical compound, you know, this is, just gives you a little per bit of perspective. Okay, so how does this all square with the conventional wisdom of uh, artificial flavors? Uh, the common understanding today is that anything artificial is bad and anything natural is good. Um, so the short answer is that that conventional wisdom is wrong and we have to reevaluate that. But here I think we should draw a distinction between uh, the different kinds of added flavors. So when we talk about natural flavors versus artificial flavors, uh, we're talking about those words as they appear on a label. Uh, and both natural and artificial flavors are added flavors. Um, so when we look at added flavors, you know, we have everything from uh, flavors that are extracted from a fruit, like you know, an orange, orange juice, um, and then added back into the orange juice later. So they take the flavor oils out, they add it back in uh, later on. And that's the reason that you know, if you drink Tropicana orange juice in January, uh, it still has the same taste as when you drink it in July, because obviously those oranges that are harvested in January aren't gonna taste quite as full but they uh, extract some of the flavors and then they add them back, they store them and then they add them back later. So it gives you a kind of consistent orange juice uh, throughout the year. And that, that uh, category is the first one, it's called FTNF or from the named fruit. Uh, and when they do that, they don't have to list it on the label. Uh, but following that, there's several variations of you know, natural extracts, natural flavors mixed with synthetic flavors, you know, Purified flavors derived naturally, purified flavors derived artificially, all those different combinations. But okay, so the, the bottom line is that actually a lot of those variations, uh, some of them, it might be a natural flavor or it might be artificial, but it could be chemically identical. Uh, it's really just a matter of the process uh, of, of how those molecular compounds were derived. And so if we could somehow look at all the flavor molecules uh, that a banana produces, um, and figure out what their ratios are, back to the kind of all-natural banana. You know, if we're able to take a look at all of these compounds here, and these are all the flavors, not all of them, because there's a lot more actually, but these are some of the main flavors, uh, we could look at the, propor the proportions that they show up in a banana, and then get another source for each of those different purified compounds, add it together, and then we have banana flavor. And then we can put that in a you know, banana bread, or banana pudding, or you know, a kind of vitamin tablet, and that's the basis for the artificial flavor industry. So these are actually just some of the compounds that are found in a banana, and it's basically the way that you can analyze a banana or any, any other sort of flavor is through gas chromatography uh, mass spectrometry, and this is the readout of analyzing a banana extract. And so you can see another really long list of chemical names that sound really scary. And there's some interesting descriptors on the, on the right of how each of those molecules smell individually because some of those molecules might smell totally different than a banana if you smell them in isolation, but then if you combine them with other molecules, then you get something that you know, then smells like a banana. So it's, it can be pretty interesting to look at those. So basically any uh, flavor or any smell is just a collection of certain specific uh, scent molecules or flavor molecules in specific proportions. And flavor and smell are closely linked. Uh, about 80% of what we experience as flavor is actually the smell of the food as we're eating it, that we were able to actually smell through the back of our uh, nose. It's called retronasal olfaction, and it's a very big part of, of flavor. If you ever hold your nose and you know, eat something, you can notice that you're, you're really missing out on a lot of the actual flavor. Um, and when we talk about you know, artificial flavors, we're mainly talking about those uh, odor volatiles. Uh, more so than uh, things like sugar or glutamic acid uh, that act on the tongue. Now, the problem with uh, gas chromatography mass spec is that you know, the machine pretty much treats everything the same. Uh, it's not, in some cases, it's not as sensitive as the human nose. Uh, so in some foods, you'll have molecules that 
you know, you, you, the human nose could smell it at like one part per billion, and that's the equivalent of like a drop in an, an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Um, and the machine won't pick that up, but it could make a major impact on the actual flavor. Uh, so in coffee, this is especially true. Uh, there's lots of um, compounds that have uh, sulfur in them, and you might know that you know the compounds in like a skunk spray also have sulfur. It's part of the reason that they smell so strongly. Uh, so, you know, coffee is one area where it's very hard to analyze it. It's very hard to reconstruct it artificially. So, um, one of the first molecules to be artificially synthesized was vanillin. And so, vanillin is a molecule that's found in the actual vanilla bean plant. Uh, but it's also something that you can synthesize in lots of different ways. And it was kind of the foundation of artificial flavor chemistry. Uh, so this shows just three different ways that you can synthesize vanillin. Uh, you can get it from petroleum products. You can get it from uh, wood pulp. You can get it from clove oil. And then this is how it is metabolized and synthesized in the actual organism of the, the vanilla plant. But to make matters a little bit more complicated, um, there's also compounds that don't exist in nature that over the last 100 years or so, the flavor industry has um, devised. And here's an example of ethyl vanillin on the right. It's very similar to vanillin, but it has, it's about 2.5 times stronger in flavor. So that means that you can use less than half as much for the same effect. Um, and a lot of these compounds that don't exist in nature might have a stronger and more natural seeming kind of smell or odor or, or flavor. Um, so this is just a kind of real quick to look, look at, you know, the difference between man-made and uh, natural you know, chemical compounds, as well as uh, dangerous and not so dangerous ones. So, you know, on the upper left, these are some very, very dangerous compounds that are produced by, uh, by plants. Uh, so amygdalin, which is produced in uh, apple seeds, for example. On the upper right, man-made chemicals. These are also the dangerous ones. But if you get lower, there's propylene glycol, um, there's water, uh, citric acid, sugar. Uh, these are not so dangerous. So it's it really, there's no necessarily, there's not necessarily a correspondence between whether something's natural and artificial, whether it exists in nature, and whether it's healthy or unhealthy. Um, so one of the things about, so one of the things about artificial uh, flavors, and the reason that they're so widely used, is that they're cheaper. Now the um, counterintuitive thing is that, um, if we embrace artificiality, which I would propose, uh, in fact, a lot of artificial flavors are better for the environment than natural flavors. This might seem completely counterintuitive, but I'll just explain a little bit further. Um, so, yeah, so the reason that they're better for the environment usually corresponds with the reason that they're so much cheaper. Uh, this is from a chemical supplier called Sigma Aldrich. Uh, they use, they produce a lot of chemicals for research purposes. This is methylanthranolate. Um, you might be familiar with it. You've definitely consumed it in uh, kind of a purple uh, grape soda, for example. But it also occurs in jasmine and um, other kinds of flower extracts. So uh, you can see on the upper right, the synthetic version of the same molecule is $61. On the lower right, the natural version is $1,834 per kilogram. Uh, now the reason for this is that to extract the actual uh, molecule naturally, it requires immense resources in terms of growing acres and acres of jasmine flowers, in this case, and extracting all the essential volatile oils from them, and then purifying that, uh, whereas if you make it synthetically from pre-existing chemical compounds, uh, it can be a much, much less resource intensive and actually environmentally friendly process. Um, so you can see in a typical fruit, like an apple, uh, the flavors are about 0.2 to 0.3 in the overall apple, in, the, in terms of the mass of the apple. Uh, and in fact, usually it's quite a bit lower, uh, down to like 0.1 uh, for most foods. So here, this is my own kind of calculations, but this is the amount of resources that it takes to make that one kilogram of natural methylanthranolate. Uh, so, basically, we, I, I won't go into all the details. Uh, there's, there's a lot here, it's a very dense slide. But it takes, by my calculation, 11,884 acres of farmland. Uh, it takes 4.5 billion gallons of water. 
And the greenhouse gases, there was no way to calculate that, but if you just think about all the equipment that um, is used on the farm that runs on petroleum, is releasing CO2 into the air. Uh, if you think about the water pumps on the farm that are running off of uh, petroleum, typically, and the um, fertilizer as well is, is often uh, petroleum based. So you can see that you're probably using massively more petroleum to make the same exact chemical compound if you use it, if you do it naturally versus artificially. Here's a little bit more details about that uh, overall calculation. But basically, you know, jasmine oil, which is where they get, uh, from what I found out from the chemical supplier, that's where the methylanthranolate is sourced from, sourced from pressed jasmine oil. And uh, it takes about a thousand pounds or a thousand kilograms of jasmine oil to make one kilogram of what they call jasmine concrete. And then from that, jasmine concrete, it's 0.2%, I believe. Yeah, 0.2% are the actual flavor molecules, right? And then, um, so you're looking at that 0.2% of one, of one kilogram that itself is already 0.1% of, you know, the thousand kilograms that you've already, you know, processed of these jasmine flowers. You know, just to give kind of some perspective on it. What is another reason for embracing artificiality? Well, for me, I started as an artist. Uh, I'm still an artist, and I consider the flavors that I make to be artworks. Yeah, so aside from these you know, really significant ecological benefits of using actual artificial flavors, um, one area that is very limiting about using natural flavors is that you're linked to what already exists in the world. But if, you know, every flavor is just a collection of molecules, you can mix any combination of molecules together to get a flavor. And probably what we're you know, familiar with is just a very, very small fraction of the overall space of the possible molecules that you can, or the possible flavor combinations that could exist, that you could try. Um, and so the, you know, the industry has spent a lot of time trying to figure out, just even trying to apply language to, this, uh, to a sense that is as complex as smell and flavor is very um, limiting. There's just not even a language to describe this kind of vast amount of possibilities that are present in flavors and, and in fragrances. Um, if you compare it to vision, we have three uh, color receptor cones in our eyes. So basically all the different colors we see are a variation of three uh, kind of on or off switches. Uh, with flavor, we have about 400 in the nose plus what we have on the taste buds as well, which is about five specific types of receptors, but they keep finding new ones actually. Uh, so if you think about kind of, yeah, here's the overall space of, you know, what is possible in that upper right. And then, you know, there's a few dots here and there, and that's pretty much what we're actually familiar with. So, you know, coming from an art perspective, that's what's most interesting to me is these new combinations. You know, in painting, you can't make a new color. There's all the colors have been made, right? But with flavors, with fragrances, you actually can. Uh, but you have to go artificial to do it. Um, so, um, you know, in the history of visual art, it's already gone through a process of experimentation where, you know, 150 years ago, all Western artworks were realistic, right? They were all referencing something in nature, uh, something in the world. And uh, whether it was a sculpture or a painting, you know, it had to be realistic. But then in the past 150 years, there was a whole explosion of experimentation and abstract painting and later things like, you know, video art and performance and just everything that you can imagine. You know, art has gone through that process, but, you know, food hasn't. Uh, and I think even some of the most uh, compelling and important uh, areas, applications of food technology. Uh, so we have, you know, New Harvest kind of cultured meat, and we have Beyond Meat, the plant-based burger. Very important, you know, very amazing, but they're what I would call skeuomorphic. They're looking, they're kind of still in that kind of realist phase. You know, they're using new technologies, new techniques uh, to make the old stuff that we're already familiar with. Um, so, you know, I would be a proponent of, you know, breaking open that mold, doing something that hasn't been done. But, you know, that being said, you know, I can understand kind of what, from a uh, commercial perspective, I can understand where they're coming from. And I think, you know, the benefits of getting people that regularly eat meat to uh, try to have plant-based uh, protein is, is very immense. So I don't, you know, fault them for that. But just on my own, um, 
you know, in terms of my own philosophy, my own interests, uh, I, you know, I'm interested in doing something that hasn't been done. So again, here's kind of like, this is more kind of a modeling of, you know, some of the odors and, and, and uh, types of flavors that, you know, have been looked at. And so you can kind of imagine the whole space of possibilities as this like three-dimensional cube, right? That it contains every, each point contains every, uh, a, a different possibility of combining molecules together to get a certain kind of flavor. So we were looking at all these little dots and then, but what about all the empty space? So um, to go back to, you know, what I see as the kind of skeuomorphic um, tangent in a lot of uh, food uh, technology these days, um, you know, do, do people crave hamburgers? Do they have cravings for hamburgers because they're objectively the most delicious possible food that you can construct? Or is it, is it you know, so, to some degree, a kind of conditioning? Um, you know, there, there's certainly a amount of, a certain combination of things like glutamate and sugar and salt, you know, that taste good on the tongue. But when we're talking about those flavor volatiles, uh, that's more of an aspect of conditioning. It's more, you know, something that you've eaten throughout your whole life, you're gonna typically, you know, want to have that food, uh, even when there's so many other possibilities. So in other words, you know, a lot of the things we find delicious today are partially arbitrary. Uh, there might be something, uh, you know, in, in the food that is, you know, inherently delicious, but most of it is cultural conditioning. And we should be aware of that, you know, because there's a whole other realm of possibilities, as I've said. You know, even Coca-Cola, if you think about it, it was kind of an abstract flavor. Now it's one of the most familiar flavors, but when it was first uh, produced, it was kind of an abstract flavor. It was kind of this flavor that you couldn't really put your finger on what it was. Um, it wasn't trying to mimic a certain kind of fruit, for example. Uh, so recently, I've founded a company called Aquaforma, and we uh, make food out of algae, microalgae, and uh, chlorella, spirulina. Now, the reasons for doing this are mainly ecological. Uh, it's one of the most environmentally efficient foods. It can produce you know, a great deal of nutrients with very little resources in comparison to other crops like corn or soy um, or fruits, you know, basically any kind of land crop. Uh, and part of the reason for this is that uh, algae grows in tanks. It's in a closed system. So you're not irrigating acres and acres of land to get, you know, these uh, plants that you can only eat about 10% of it, just the seeds of the fruit, for example. But the main, one of the main um, hurdles to consumers adopting algae as a um, staple kind of food source is the flavor. And so that's kind of what the, the company focuses on, is you know, taking these, this unfamiliar food substance that you know, has great environmental benefits and has a great nutritional profile. It's also a great source of plant-based protein so taking that and uh, making it a bit more palatable, but we don't want to make it 100% familiar. You know, we do want to kind of make it interesting and exciting and a kind of new flavor that we hope will become the next, uh, you know, the next generation's familiar flavor. I mean, every flavor that's really new now was, or every flavor that's familiar now was new at some point. Um, and so one other thing that Aquaforma is interested in doing is, um, you know, if you think about flavors, it's usually a black box, right? It's usually, um, even, even for the manufacturers of the food product, they don't know what's in the flavor because the flavor company keeps it a secret. Uh, even, and then also with natural extracts, uh, it's, the flavors can just be too complex to even delineate all the different molecules that are in it, you know, like what we saw with the uh, kind of analysis of the banana. So uh, one other advantage to artificial flavors is that you could actually, and this is something that Aquaforma hopes to do, uh, you could actually list every single uh, molecule that goes into the artificial flavor. So you could have a kind of open source flavor. Um, and we're kind of limited by, you know, where consumers are at right now because obviously, you know, we're still thinking about this and if we go ahead and do that, there's like, what are the chances that people are gonna freak out by all these chemical names? You know, which is why we really have to, we feel the need to kind of educate people about the differences between, you know, natural and artificial flavors and about just basic kind of chemistry and flavor chemistry. So, you know, we're very excited about all these possibilities. And with this um, presentation, I hope that we can really begin a reevaluation of some of the conventional wisdom about the differences between natural and artificial. Um, and uh, 
well, it might seem like kind of a major shift in what we're familiar with. Um, you know, let's just look at it in context and think about how much our food, especially the natural kind of food, how much it's changed since humans first started eating it. Thank you very much. <laughs>